Thanks for joining us, everyone. We're going to wait just a few seconds for more people to log on, and then we'll get started. Jennifer, I think we can start now. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining our um, virtual program tonight. And I am Jennifer Reed. I'm the executive director of the Cass County Historical Society. And we are uh, doing this virtual program in uh, collaboration with the Cass County uh, Public Library, the Harrisonville branch. So welcome to all of you all as well. Um, tonight, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker. And this is uh, Carol Babbitt, and she is the executive director of the Missouri Prairie Foundation. She oversees operations of this 56-year-old conservation organization and land trust, including its Grow Native program. She has worked for 25 years in the conservation and environmental field in communications, development, administration, and leadership capacity. She has worked for private, nonprofit conservation groups and at the municipal and state government levels. So no further ado, we will hand it over to Carol. Thanks, Jennifer. Thanks everyone for tuning in. I'm um, happy to speak to you. Tonight, I'm gonna talk about the benefits of native plants to Missouri communities. And if any of you have any questions during my presentation uh, or at the end, please use the Q&A function. Um, you should see a button at the bottom of your screen. And then when I'm done speaking, Jennifer will come back on and she will read those questions aloud to me. This uh, presentation is being recorded and we will make it available on the Missouri Prairie Foundation YouTube channel and share it with the Cass County Historical Society and the library should they wish to uh, link to it on their sites. I do wanna thank the Missouri Humanities Council, uh, which uh, helps support this program. So I wanna talk first about a little bit about my organization and why we do what we do. We protect prairie and we promote native plants. Our mission is to protect and restore make remaining prairie and other native grassland communities. And we do that by acquiring land, managing it, educating about the importance of prairie and supporting prairie research. And we also promote the use of plants that are native to prairies and every other habitat type in the state through our Grow Native program. And in addition, we administer a group called the Missouri Invasive Plant Council. Why do we do what we do? We do this because tall grass prairie is a really important part of our natural and cultural history, including our communities. And tall grass prairie remnants, and by remnant, I mean a piece of original unplowed prairie. Even though they're rare, they are significant reservoirs of native biodiversity from plants, pollinators, birds, and other animals to millions of soil microorganisms. And remnants exist in or near our communities. And you have uh, several amazing prairie remnants in Cass County, which I'll talk about in a little bit. We have so much to learn from prairie and prairie's direct benefits to people. And then we also promote the use of plants that are native from many habitats because they provide so many benefits to wildlife and people. We also are concerned about invasive plants because they're a threat to our native biodiversity, our communities, and many aspects of our economy. Before Euro-American uh, settlement, or I should say up until, up until our, our statehood in 1821, there were 15 million acres of prairie at the time of statehood. And today, there are fewer than 50,000 scattered acres of original prairie remaining today. So it's an incredibly dramatic loss. And so the Missouri Prairie Foundation works very hard to protect as many of those remaining acres as we can and also to reconstruct prairie landscapes. So what is prairie? It's a native grassland ecosystem. It's dominated by perennial warm season grasses, broadleafed plants, like wildflowers, sedges, and scattered shrubs. And there's less than 10% tree cover on prairies. And, and what I mean by warm season grasses, I mean grasses that are maturing at the hottest part of the year. So tall fescue is a non-native cool season grass 
it does the best during the cooler parts of the year and goes dormant in the hottest parts of the year. Whereas the grasses that you can see in this photo here are, they're mostly all, uh, there are some native cool season grasses in this photo, but most of them are warm season grasses. They're green in the hottest part of the year. And in this part of the prairie region, prairie evolved mostly with fire and drought and also grazing. Um, but the grazing wasn't necessarily by bison and elk wasn't uniform across the whole prairie region as far as we know. In other parts of the uh, country, like further west of here, drought is a, was a bigger factor than fire in shaping prairie. Um, but in terms of native plants, uh, of course we have native plants from not just prairie, but woodland, forest, savanna communities also glades, cliffs, and wetlands. And our communities are found in or near all of these different types of communities. Um, when our towns and cities were founded, they were founded in some kind of natural habitat. And we've changed or altered or destroyed so much of that in our communities, but many of our communities still have remnants. Um, and even if they don't, we can use plants from these different habitat types, planting them in our communities for our benefit, which I'll get into in a moment. And you might be asking, well, what makes a plant native? So when I use the word native plant, I mean one that occurs originally within a region as a result of natural processes rather than human intervention. So before, Euro-Americans were here, even before Native Americans were here, there were dogwoods, white oak, black-eyed Susan, persimmon, and 2,000 other native plants. When we think of things like um, boxwoods, petunias, tomatoes, those are all plants that are native to other parts of the world, and we've brought them here to use them for food or for landscaping or other purposes. We have more than 2,000 different kinds of native plant species more than the state of Alaska, even though Alaska is so much larger than we are in terms of land mass. And many native plants in Missouri occur in specific habitats. They don't occur just everywhere. For example, this um, plant here called Indian pink, it's native to southeastern Missouri. I don't think you would find it in Cass County in the wild. And while Native Americans did affect the region's ecosystems because they uh, carried out some, some forms of agriculture and they hunted and they gathered um, and they had settlements, um, it wasn't until the mid 1800s with Euro American settlement that large scale habitat alteration and the introduction of non-native plants began to significantly change the natural landscape of Missouri and the rest of the Midwest. There were Native Americans living here on and with the land for thousands of years. And in fact, in terms of prairie, um, prairie expanded because of the fire practices of Native Americans. In this part of the world here in Missouri, we're where the Eastern deciduous forest and the Great Plains meet. We have less rainfall than someplace like Georgia but more rainfall than west of here. So we can support trees with the rainfall that we have. If we did not use fire to manage prairies, trees would grow up in them and biodiversity overall would decline. The photo on the left is, those are photos of tall fescue grass. They're non-native. They now cover at least 14 million acres of Missouri. So looking again at the photo on the right and the photo, the, the painting of the um, Osage man, yes, they did ha have some alterations on the landscape, but nothing like what has happened since Euro-American Euro settlement. And for example, the tall fescue grass was introduced in the 1950s, and now it covers almost a third of our state. Because um, the Missouri Prairie Foundation recognizes the very critical role of Native Americans in our prairie landscapes and how important it was to them. In 2021, we created a land acknowledgement statement, which I will read to you now. We respectfully acknowledge that the land we work to protect was the homeland of a diversity of Native American nations prior to European American settlement. 
the land in our care continues to have cultural significance for the Osage, Missouri, Sac and Fox, Iowa, Kaw, and other Native American nations. We are mindful that these nations had a significant role in shaping the landscape and that they continue a sacred relationship with the lands we protect. We recognize and appreciate their contributions to the cultural heritage of this region and to the history of North America. We honor them as we protect the ecological integrity of the lands in our care. And I think it's important when we talk about the benefits of native plants to communities to take a very um, historical view of this, um, that people have been using native um, plants in their communities for thousands of years in this part of the world. As I mentioned here in this first bullet point that human communities have been depending on native plants and native plant communities for thousands of years from hunter gatherer communities to farmers today who are mining prairie soil for the last past 200 years to, 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 in, in, to the present and also to new uses of native plants in some Missouri communities today. Human communities have extirpated or removed many native plants or altered natural systems so much that ecological function has been lost. So for example, before there was stream channelization and impervious services like parking lots and roads, large rain events were largely absorbed by extensive native grasslands and woodlands and wide flood floodplains and wetlands. Flooding has always been a natural occurrence, but flooding as we know it today is really the result of our alterations to the land. It's also important to note that native plant species have co-evolved with native insect species and provide important food resources for thousands of species of invertebrates. And those invertebrates, like caterpillars, are in turn food for native birds and other animals. Nature isn't out there far away. We have altered 93% of land in the United States. And in order for wild species to survive, which I think we want to because it makes life so rich and enjoyable, we have to make our human communities as habitable as possible for pollinators, songbirds, and other wildlife. So native plants are important to communities today because they've evolved here over thousands of years and they're best adapted to our region's climate and soil conditions. And because of these adaptations, they're well suited to addressing many challenges that communities face today, like control, managing stormwater, connecting children to nature, protecting urban streams for park and green space management and for other purposes. On the photo in the bottom left is um, a greenway in St. Louis area. We can see that, that, that steep um, slope there that could be mowed with tall fescue grass and that would cause um, work for that would, that would be work that would have to be done, you know, many times a year. Um, it wouldn't provide any kind of food sources for pollinators. It wouldn't be very interesting to look at. It wouldn't really manage stormwater very well. Instead, there's a native prairie planting there. The photo on the right is a wastewater treatment plant. And um, like a lot of uh, industry, a lot of times wastewater treatment plants need a large buffer of land around them for security reasons or for odor uh, issues. And instead of having that just be mowed grass, why not have a prairie planting? Um, it, it adds many benefits. So that's just two examples of how, to, how native plants can be used in a community. Just this week, um, I got a news release about uh, a study showing that nearly half of city gross, gross domestic product is at risk from nature loss. Um, I apologize for all this text here, but in the first bullet point, this, this is this news release that I got, the World Economic Forum's Biodiverse Cities um, by 2030 initiative, they've just published a report called Biodiverse Cities by 2030, Transforming Cities' Relationship with Nature. And it's addressing the urgency of cities untenable relationship with nature shows that 44% of gross domestic product in cities around the world, 21, $31 trillion is at risk of disruption from nature loss. The study also went on to say that nature-based solutions are on average 50% more cost-effective than man-made alternatives and deliver 28% more added value. We'll talk more about that in a moment. 
according to the World Economic Forum, a nature positive pathway in infrastructure and built environment could create over $3 trillion in business opportunities and create 117 million jobs by 2030. And when they talk about nature-based solutions, they include things like protecting intact natural communities within human communities, using native plants to manage stormwater, planting trees and other appropriate vegetation to cool cities, establishing prairie plantings to absorb carbon. But before I get into all of that, I do want to pause and talk about how important, you know, all the reasons we should be promoting using and celebrating native plants in our communities. And one um, really important reason, I think, is because native plants and the habitats in which they grow provide a special sense of place. Um, as I mentioned before, when I showed that photo of the Indian pink, that plant doesn't occur everywhere in Missouri. In Missouri, it occurs in Southeast Missouri. So it's regional in nature. It make, it's, it's one of the things that makes that region really special. Prairie in Southwestern and Northern Missouri and Cass County is one of the things that makes Cass County special. There are wild azaleas in St. Genevieve County. That's the photo in the upper left that they don't occur much beyond that county, if at all. There's native shortleaf pine in the Ozarks. Um, and there are also natural and cultural celebrations in our state um, built around native plants, like we have dogwood festivals in some communities and pecan and walnut harvests. We've changed so much of the landscape um, that Sometimes when you drive down a, a, an urban or a suburban street like this one here, you don't really know where you are. Maybe you're in Nashville, Tennessee, or St. Louis, or Joplin. It could be anywhere. We've changed so much, but native vegetation helps give us a sense of place and make each place special. And in Cass County, you have a very special place called Snowball Hill Prairie. And this is owned and managed by the Missouri Prairie Foundation. And it's, it's an example of an intact remnant natural community that's protected um, right near the town. It's right outside the town of Harrisonville. This is a welcome sign that you would see if you visit this property, it's open to the public. And I'm going to show you just a few photos of the special place in Cass County. Snowball Hill Prairie gets its name from the pronounced hill that you can see here, which some say often appeared white from all of the bunch flower when it's in bloom. And that's what this, these spikes of flowers are here. Um, we often have tours here. Uh, here's a photo from a fall tour in early spring. You might find these really special plants, ground plum and biscuit root. Um, ground plum is the purple flower and the yellow flower is called hairy parsley. Um, they, they're at the very top of the um, hill where the soil is really dry. You, can, you might also find a, a plant pictured on the right called adder's tongue fern. It's actually a fern, um, and it, but it grows in really dry areas. Um, there's cream wild indigo, prairie phlox. Um, there's a species of conservation concern called Vices skipper that um, the caterpillars feed on prairie cordgrass that's been found at Snowball Hill Prairie um, in the fall. There are these beautiful downy gentian flowers. So it's so important if there are remnant natural communities that are intact to protect those because we can never get them back. We can create a prairie planting, but we can never create an original prairie in all of its complexity. But even if you don't have intact remnant communities, you can make your community special by uh, choosing native plants for plantings. This is a native garden in St. Genevieve. It attracts butterflies. It's really lovely. A beautiful native planting by the train station in Kirkwood. And what's really cool about this is as people are traveling on the train, there are also monarch butterflies traveling on their migration, which stop there. Um, this is a, a native planting at a public library in Ashland, Missouri. And inside the library, they have a whole display about native plants and they can tie in some of their um, um, resources that they have like books on prairie 
and really tie that to this prairie planting and, and make a really you know rich enrich an experience for their patrons. Um, so now I want to get into some of those nature-based solutions um, that I mentioned from that, that news release that came out this week. Another reason to promote, use, and celebrate native plants is for these nature-based solutions. As I mentioned before, native plants in the Midwest, they've evolved here over thousands of years. They're best adapted to the region's climate and soil conditions. And because of these adaptations, they're well suited to addressing a lot of the challenges that communities face today such as stormwater management, protecting urban streams, park and green space management. The photo on the left is in Chicago. And there's a, like in a lot of cities, there's you know strips of um, green space just hemmed in with streets and concrete can be kind of an inhospitable place for growing things. But that's where plants that are from our glades um, or plants like this native horsetail that are used to compact soil because they grow along um, streams and, and river bottoms that can often be flooded and have really compacted soil. They work great in, in cities because of those adaptations. Um, this is a, a photo of Elmer, Emerald Arbovitae um, that has died. <laughs> And it's not adapted to Missouri's climate. And the only way it could ever survive if it got tons of water and if the temperature stayed below a certain temperature, it's just not adapted. Um, we might choose these because we, you know, they are beautiful when they're alive, but there are so many beautiful native plants that are uh, adapted to our growing conditions. Here's just a, here's a, a formal planting of, of some native plants. You can see how beautiful and attractive they are. Another reason to promote, use, and celebrate native plants is because they are resources for economic health in and near our communities. Um, Missouri is a huge forest products state. In 2014, the industry, and that includes lumber, paper, edibles, and other related products, contributed almost $10 billion to our economy and supported more than 44,000 jobs. And this industry is especially important for many communities in the Ozarks. You can see the oak barrels and the walnut um, uh, uh, wood there that's going to be hewn into um, uh, other products. And then the black walnuts on the left. And it's not just our forest products industry um, where native plants play an important role, but also prairie plants. We're a huge cattle production state. We have something like 68,000 cattle producers in our state. And most of the pasture that they feed on is tall fescue, which is um, provides important forage for the cool uh, months of the year, but it's largely dormant in the summer. And we encourage um, livestock producers to, to um, explore cost share opportunities available through federal and state cost share to convert at least some of that fescue pasture to native grasses and wildflowers. So they have really healthy, um, nutritious forage in the summer months as well. Another reason to promote use and celebrate native plants is for um, their ability to uh, for the ability of prairie plants to and other native plants to absorb carbon and also for erosion control and stream protection. This is a hypothetical drawing of, um, the, of how deep prairie plant roots can, uh, can grow. They don't, it depends on the soil type, if the soil is very rocky, things like that, they might not attain this, the, this full depth, but they can. <laughs> as this illustration shows, um, as much as 11 inches of rain from one rain event, excuse me, as much as seven inches of rain from one rain event can be absorbed by intact prairie, that's, in, that's a prairie remnant or prairie planting with no runoff. And if you think back to that news release about the, the study, planting prairie plants like this is so much less expensive than a lot of man-made um, alternatives like you know, very heavily engineered stormwater um, storage facilities that are underground and things like that. Also installing bioswales and other plantings with native plants and communities 
are powerful flood mitigation and stormwater management tools. These are uh, three photos of rain gardens or um, bioretention areas using native plants in uh, parking lots and other areas. Um, these are some like simpler, but it, the um, photo on the left is a, is a gas station in South in St. Louis region. Just think about how many gas stations and other places have ditches like this. Well, what if instead of all those ditches being mowed, if the water, the runoff could be allowed to go into those ditches, as you can see in this photo with those gravel cutouts, the water empties into this ditch and these native plants are absorbing all, they're slowing that down, they're absorbing that water, reducing flooding, keeping contaminants out of streams, they're trapping those contaminants. And those blooming plants are providing nectar and pollen for native bees and butterflies. The photo on the right shows just one plant, and that is prairie cordgrass being used in a, in a strip between, um, between um, uh, uh, parking lot spaces. And not just in parking lots and in cities, but native plants can be used to manage stormwater and control erosion and protect streams in rural areas near communities. In this photo, this is a soybean fields. And you can see, though, in the foreground, the strip of prairie plants. And this is a practice called prairie strips, whereby uh, strips of prairie plants are planted within or along the edges of soybean and corn fields to help protect productive farmland, help keep it productive by um, preventing sediment from running off of that area into streams, um, if there are any um, fertilizers used on the corn or soybean field, it gets trapped in these strips rather than running off into streams. Um, this device you see here is called a flume. And in the photo on the right, the flume is um, at the low end of a cornfield, and you can see how much sediment is trapped from runoff. The photo on the right is 100% prairie. There is no soil being run off. And then in a prairie with a prairie strip, the photo, um, I don't have a photo, I'm sorry to show you, but it looks pretty much like the flume on the right. It's just a, just a very small amount of sediment. And this, I'm gonna show you an infographic in a moment that just that shows this better. So if you look on the um, left half of this, um, graphic, it shows a 100% crop field. On average, eight inches of soil is running off. Four tons of, um, or sorry, eight inches of rain are running off. Four tons an acre of sediment is lost. Seven pounds per the acre of phosphorus is lost. 35 pounds per acre of nitrogen lost. In the right-hand portion of the graphic, you see that just 10% of that row crop area is planted with prairie strips, 42% less water running off, 95% less soil leaving that area, 89% less phosphorus leaving it, and 84% less nitrogen. It's an incredible tool. And if any of you are uh, row crop farmers, um, if you're interested, I have a grant that will help pay for the establishment of prairie strips on your land. And there's also federal cost share um, available. And at the end of my presentation, I have my contact information. Another reason to promote use and celebrate native plants in our communities is health and nutrition for people. One out of every three bites of food is made possible to us thanks to insect pollinators. Insect pollination in general contributes almost $30 billion of added value to the agricultural economy in the US every year. In Missouri, more than 560,000 acres are planted in crops that are dependent upon or improved by the pollination services of honeybees and native bees. In Missouri, insect pollinators occur in all habitats, but there are more species of pollinators on prairies and other native grasslands than any other habitat type in the state. About 400 species of pollinating insects um, can be found on Missouri's prairie remnants. Most of our most nutrient-rich foods, which are fruits and vegetables, cannot produce without insect pollinators. 
We can help sustain insects that provide pollination services to us by choosing native plants in our communities. Sorry, I'm having trouble getting this to um, go to the next slide. I am not sure what's going on here. Um, oh, here we go. Oops, I see what happened. So I wanna show you um, what, what I mean by pollinators. So in there are many different kinds of pollinators. Some are animals like bats and even lizards and some primates. But here in Missouri, the pollinators that do most of the work are clockwise from the top left, butterflies, bees, flies. The, the insect on the yellow flower looks like a bee, but it's actually a native fly. Beetles, wasps, and moths. And of these, bees are the most efficient pollinators because they are actively collecting and transporting pollen, as you can see on this bumblebee, all those yellow grains or pollen grains. And because bees exhibit floral constancy, which means that when they go out on a trip to forage for pollen, they, they don't jump from one kind of flower to a different kind of flower. They might go out and get pollen from cone flowers on one trip. And another trip, they might go get it from, from um, goldenrod. And that's important because you need pollen grains from one flower to go to, to another flower of the same species. You can't, the plants won't produce seeds or fruits without pollen from their species. And um, so um, honeybees are non-native, they're from Europe, they're social bees, they form colonies, but our native bees, and we have hundreds of species of them, are, all of them are solitary except for bumblebees, those are also social. But solitary bees um, can need a whole year for their life cycle, and they, they have their nests either in the ground or in cavities, and I mentioned this that it takes a year to show you that they need an undisturbed area. So tilling can disturb them or chemicals that go into the ground, things like that. Um, so they need habitat to, you know, for a whole year for their life cycle. So this is showing um, bees underground and, Sorry, I'm having trouble getting this to advance again. Any second now. Um, so they're ground nesting bees, like, like what I just showed you. And um, I'll mention one thing while I'm on the slide. Um, of course, you don't want a lot of, you know, if you have a native garden in your yard, you don't want a lot of weeds coming up. But if you heavily mulch, it can make it impossible for the bees to find soil to create a nest in. And a lot of native plants don't like heavy mulch anyway. You can avoid mulch altogether by planting the plants more densely or just using a very thin layer of like um, composted leaves works really well. And as I mentioned, in addition to the soil, the nests, the bees that make nests in soil, there's also ones that make nests in tunnels, they tunnel nesting and, and they might um, use hollow stems. And it's really important to leave stems standing through the winter because those, those bees have laid eggs in there in the summer or the spring, and then they need to develop the whole year. As I mentioned, um, these pollinators are so important for our human health. This is a photo of a Whole Foods Market produce section showing bee pollinated crops. And this is that same section without bee pollinated crops. So you can see how important they are to our health. And we also wanna promote use and celebrate native plants, not just for our own health, but for the health and nutrition of wildlife. As I mentioned before, native plants have co-evolved with native insect species and provide important food resources for thousands of species of invertebrates and provide, in turn, provide food for native birds and other animals. Again, nature isn't out there far away being taken care of somewhere else. We have altered 93% of land in our country. And in order for wild species to survive, we have to make our human communities as habitable as possible for pollinators, songbirds, and other wildlife. And we can do that with native plants. The photo in the bottom left is a marsh milkweed with a monarch caterpillar on it. And milkweeds are the only food um, that, the only plants that monarchs can eat, monarch caterpillars can eat. And 
There are relationships like this with thousands of different kinds of insects. Um, and birds like the bluebird on the uh, right, you can see has a caterpillar in its beak. It's either going to eat that or it's gonna take it back to its nest and feed it to its babies. You may have heard of Dr. Doug Tallamy. He's an entomologist, he studies insects, and he's written several books um, based on his research showing this relationship between insects and native plants and how they're, these insects are eating, eating native plants and they, they can't just necessarily, some, some insects might eat plants from many different kinds of plants, but many of them have eat just one, um, plants from one family of plants or plants from one genus of plants or even just from one or two species. But all of those insects are so important food for baby birds because they need soft food, just like human babies need soft food. When they're adults, they, they can eat fruits and nuts, but when they're babies, they have to have soft food. So if you see a, a bird up there in the treetops hopping from leaf to leaf, it's probably getting insects um, that are feeding on leaves. And it's not a problem that they're feeding on leaves. They've been doing it for thousands of years. They're not gonna kill our trees. So, um, this is something covered in this book. And unfortunately, I can't hear you, but I'm gonna ask you, can you think of which group of trees supports the greatest diversity of moth, moths and butterflies, meaning that their caterpillars eat the leaves of these trees? Well, I will just tell you, <laughs> it's, it's oak trees. And this is a chart from the book that shows um, woody plants and the number of butterfly and moth caterpillar species that they support. So oaks support more than 500 different kinds of, of butterfly and moth caterpillars. And black cherries are also really important and willows and birch and poplar and so on and so forth. Same question, but for wildflowers, which wildflower do you think supports the greatest diversity of moth and butterfly caterpillars. So we're not, we're not talking about the flower and providing nectar or pollen for butterflies, but actually the leaves, the leaves of which flower supports the greatest diversity of butterfly and moth caterpillars. It is goldenrods. Goldenrods are so important. They're important for nectar and pollen for butterflies and bees, but their leaves are so important for more than a hundred different kinds of butterfly and moth caterpillars. Asters, sunflowers, and on down the list are all important. So some people think that goldenrod creates um, allergies. They don't because, and here's a rule of thumb, if you see insects visiting a flower, that means it has to be insect pollinated that pollen is too heavy to be carried by the wind. If it's too heavy to be carried by the wind, it can't enter our nasal passages. But it blooms at the same time as ragweed on the right, and that is wind pollinated, but it's, it's the flowers are so small, we don't really notice them amidst all the golden, you know, golden fields of goldenrod. When you see a bird out in a goldenrod field, it's probably there getting insects that are feeding on the leaves or also getting nectar or pollen from the flowers. But in our communities, we, we just love to simplify landscapes. We plant acres of a crop, which of course we need, or we'll plant, we'll have acres of lawn. So we've simplified things. And when we do that, it can attract pests and we lose habitat complexity. So there's a lot of things that we lose when we do simplify landscapes. This is a, a beautiful house with attractive landscaping, a lawn, but none of those plants are native. They are, it's like a, a buffet of plastic plants. There's really not anything for insects to eat because insects here haven't evolved with those plants because those are all plants from Asia and other places that are native originally. But you can have the best of both worlds. You can have a beautiful landscaping for yourself that's also a buffet for insects and birds. This particular landscape is pretty big. You know, you wouldn't have to have something this big or complicated and lots of us don't have this much yard. Um, but um, this gentleman's garden, he has a, a formal native garden in the foreground with, and he's done that with plants. And then on the fort in the background, uh, on the other side of the sidewalk, that's a prairie planting that he created with seeds. Our Grow Native program um, 
uh, provides, we have a number of native landscape plans, including one called Front Yard Formal for shade. So, if, you know, you don't like the idea of something too wild looking in your front yard. These are native plants that are, are tidier. They don't spread as much. And you don't have to even create this whole plan, but you can just use this to get some ideas, maybe plant just part of it. So that's one for shade and this is one for sun. Another reason why to promote use and celebrate native plants is for quality of life. Just the pure joy of observing nature. And you know, in our communities, there can be a lot of hustle and bustle and stress and being able to enjoy just watching an insect eat a plant. <laughs> um, you know, or visit a flower to get nectar is a de-stressor. So again, you know, we're observing these millions of years of co-evolution, um, seeing what's going on. It's really fun. Um, the photo on the right is um, my messy kitchen counter <laughs> um, with some, the plant that it's in that vase is called partridge pea. And I was outside in my, well, I had this plant along my dry run, I was looking and I saw these ripening pods of this plant, but I looked at one of those ripening pods and I thought, that's not a pod, that's a caterpillar. So if you see the, I'm, I'm pointing at my screen as if you can see me pointing, which you can't, but um, the, in the middle of the photo, the lower, the pod and the lower part of the photo is not a pod, it's a caterpillar, but you can see how much it looks like the pod. So it's really cool camouflage. So when we use natives in our parks and our downtown planters, um, we bring nature to us. We're keeping nature near to us. It helps decrease nature deficit disorder, which is a real thing. We're connecting children and adults to nature. Um, these are just some other photos. Uh, I have a upper left is a prairie garden that I have along my driveway. I have native vines on my privacy fence where I have this yellow passion flower and I get to watch this potter wasp um, collecting pollen, the photo in the lower left. I notice all these scalloped edges of this um, red bud um, seedling in my yard. Wondered what those were. There's more of them. And they're the leaf cutter bee that cuts out these little circles and uses them. There's the tunnel nesting bee using it to line its nests in, in a cat in a that's a probably looks like a cut stem, let's cut bamboo maybe. And there's all the, the larvae that are developing inside those little leaf envelopes. Um, the photo in the upper left is a pipevine swallowtail and she is laying eggs on that pipevine. And you can see the eggs in the lower left photo. And I got to see it. I got to actually see it happening. And then a couple of days later, I went out and they had hatched these tiny little caterpillars. And then I get to see them getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And then eventually crawling around outside of my house and creating um, chrysalises and even seeing the adult butterflies emerge. Um, you know, plants like uh, petunias um, and patients, they're bred to have continuous flowering. But um, with our native plants, you know, they, they're blooming at just a certain time. And that's a, like a it just makes it an extra special. Like in the photo, the lower right is a red buckeye tree that my dad planted from seed. And it, when it's blooming, we every year take a photo, a family photo, because it's a special moment in time. Um, I'm going to just wrap this up because I think I'm getting close to my time that I need to finish up. But our Grow Native program is a native plant marketing and education program. And we exist because we want to increase the demand for and supply of native plants because we know how many benefits they, they have for urban, suburban, and rural developed landscapes. So anywhere where we have altered the land, we can help bring nature back. Um, you know, we can never recreate a prairie in total, you know, in entirety, but we can definitely um, improve its ecological functioning. We have a resource guide of suppliers of native plant products and services. We'll, we're almost wrapping up our 2022 guide to be happy to supply some to the um, Harrisonville Library, other places in Cass County, it's free. Um, we have many free webinars. Um, Pre-COVID, we did a lot of workshops and tours. We hope to get back into that. Um, you, we have uh, grenade of plant tags that you can use to look for those at your plant 
um, where you buy plants. We don't grow plants ourselves. We're providing these marketing materials for our professional members who do sell plants and seeds. We have a line of Monarch Cafe um, plant tags um, that really celebrate the relationship between the plants and the insect to help just help inform customer, you know, consumers. Similarly, we have a line of tags called Pollinator Buffet that helps people understand the relationship um, between native plants and pollinating insects. Um, also, we have a program called Native Gardens of Excellence. And we want to stress that it's important to establish native plantings. It's also really important to manage them well. You know, we don't think anything of mowing our grass every week or every two weeks. And we spend a lot of money and time and energy doing that. Well, native landscapes are not maintenance free either. They do need maintenance, not as much as mowing a lawn every week, but they do need some maintenance. And these gardens are part of our program because they do have a management or stewardship plan. And so they're a good place to learn and, and visit. And you and so here's one in uh, one of them is the government plaza in Springfield. You can see how native plants are being used in this parking area to control um, stormwater. And you have a native garden of excellence in uh, Peculiar in Cass County. This is the, there are native plantings at the Peculiar Lions Club um, Community Center. I, or I have community, they're at the Lions Club there. Um, there are rain gardens and then a prairie planting. You can see how beautiful it is. There's some more information about it. You can, for each of our native gardens of excellence, you can find out when it was establish how it's maintained, how to get in touch with the people who manage it. And that's all I have for you. And um, I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Carol, thank you so much for that. Um, that was a lot of information. It was really great information. Um, and so, yeah, we will open this up uh, to some questions. From the audience, we've got a couple of folks saying thank you so much for doing this program. They really liked it. Um, they love the pictures, so we've got that. Um, we did have one question. Um, a copy of the plans um, that had the 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 gardens planted out. You know, um, she was wanting to know if there is a way to get copies of those. Um, we don't have a lot of hard copies. But I, it's all available on our website. And, um, but, you know, if there's a real interest, we could probably um, print some copies and make them available um, at the Cass County Historical Society, perhaps. But if you go to our website, um, under Learn tab, um, under Native Landscape Plans, oops. We have um, all of our, we have all the plans here. And we have that front yard formal for shade, for sun, a rock garden, songbird garden, water, blah, blah, blah. blah. So like you can just click on here and then um, get the plan. And we also, for some of these, for the man who conceived this design, we have an audio file from him where he's speaking about the plants as well. So that's a really cool thing too. Okay, um, I'm waiting for a few more questions maybe to pop in here. Um, I do have a question. Um, sure. And I do see there's there's 14 things in the chat. I don't know if those are questions also or if those are- I've been watching those come up and they've been um, thank yous for doing this. It's great to learn about uh, how the combination um, with agriculture and how some of those can be used. Um, so it's all a good job. <laughs> okay, here's one. I'll, I'll let this one come up here. Uh, I own three acres of prairie. What can I do to improve it? Um, is it original unplowed prairie or is it a prairie planting? Let them and it, we can let for them come. But if it's original unplowed prairie, if you, I, if, I don't know how it, needs to be improved. I mean, are there invasive plants or there is there are there trees growing up into it? Um, well, either way, if it's if it's an original prairie or it's a planting, if you're able to burn it periodically and, and you don't have and it's best not to burn the whole thing every year, but just part of it every year and then rotate the parts that you're burning. 
Um, that's a really important thing. If you do have invasive plants, it's, it's important to learn to identify them and to treat them. Depending on the plant, sometimes you can just remove them, but, but many times you need to remove them and, and paint the stem um, with an herbicide and just do that carefully. So it's just, um, you're treating just that, you know, that plant. Okay. If, if, um, you, have, if you have trees or, or shrubs, you might actually have to mechanically, you know, saw those and remove those. Kind of as a follow-up to that from the same um, participant is, um, wanting to know about how to increase the diversity in her prairie um, area, and she did say it was original. Okay. Um, well, if if it's original, I would, and if you haven't burned it, I really encourage you to burn it first before you introduce any any more seeds into it, because you you, you might be surprised what might what might already be in the seed bank. Of course, it's your property and, you know, you can do whatever you want with it, but if you, and, and now is a great time to burn in, in, on a, on a, you know, a dry day, um, not, not a super windy day. And, and if, um, I don't know what your uh, regulations are in Cass County, but you probably need to, you might need to, well, you need to at least alert the fire department. I don't know if you have to get a permit. You can also hire people to do the burn for you and, and you can look in our um, resource guide here on our website under um, ha wildlife habitat and ecological services, you can hire somebody to do the burn for you too. Um, but in then, so I would do that and, and wait a season and see what you've got. Um, but if you still want to seed, you can seed in the dormant season and you can buy seeds from our, um, we've got professional members who sell seeds. You can find them listed here. And again, you want to do that in the dormant season because prairie seeds need to go through a cold cycle to, to break dormancy. Um, and you want to, you don't wanna just throw them out like in a bunch of plant material. You wanna have, that's why it's, it's, it can be good to do after, after, after a burn, but again, you might wanna wait, like burn and wait a year and see what you've got and then do it next year. Um, so you wanna have contact between the seed and the soil. You don't wanna rough up the soil, especially if it's an original prairie, but you know, and you don't have to do that as long as the seed is making contact with the soil, that's fine. Wonderful. Um, another question is, are there consultations available? Uh, we don't have the staff to provide consultations, but, um, there are, you can contact, you can contact the Missouri Department of Conservation, co contact your local office. And there are um, professionals who work for the Missouri Department of Conservation called private land conservationists. And they do consultations and it's free. And they can come to your property and help give you a plan um, for management, how to improve. They can um, inform you about a different state and federal cost share programs that can help provide some funding so you don't have to pay for it all yourself. Okay, I got one other question here. Are you aware of any grants available in Illinois for installing prairie strips on farm fields? I know you mentioned the Missouri mm -hmm. uh, a grant. Is there a federal grant that would cover them in Illinois as well? So there is a pro there is a prairie strips um, uh, federal cost share program, and I'm going to show you information about that. Where you should contact your local NRCS office. It stands for Natural Resources Conservation Service and say, I'm interested in CP43, the Prairie Strips um, program. And I'm gonna, on our Missouri Prairie Foundation website, it's moprairie.org. Under what we do, Prairie Management, we have a whole page here on Prairie Strips. And you can find more information here about Prairie Strips. There's a fact sheet that tells you about this 40, P, CP43 Prairie Strips. PC43 is just kind of like the, that's the name number of that federal program. Um, but even though you are in Illinois, I think actually through my grant, I might be able to help help pay for that as well, some of it. So the CP43 can um, pay for, it can't, doesn't pay for 100%. It might pay between 50 to maybe even 90%. And my grant 
could pay for the remaining to get you up to 100%, depending on how big your, you know, how, how, how much land you have. Um, okay. Uh, another grant question, are there grants available for beekeepers? I am not aware of any, and by, but by that, do you mean to, for beekeepers to put in native plantings to, to, to provide habitat for bees? Is that what's meant? Possibly. If, if that's, follow up here. If that's yeah. the case, yeah. I don't know that there are grants for beekeepers per se, but there definitely is federal and state cost share money to help you pay for native plantings mm -hmm. of wildflowers that would help but humble bumblebee or honeybees and native bees and again i would contact either contact your local nrcs office or your missouri department of conservation local office and say i'd like to talk to a private land conservationist or i'd like to talk about to somebody about cost share to help me put in um, native prairie plantings with wildflowers and that's for any size. Uh, it's not just, we're not talking just agriculturally. It could be for your regular. I don't think it, it can't area. be just for your yard. It can't, it wouldn't, those programs wouldn't be available for just like a yard. It, okay. I don't know what the cutoff is. If it's five acres, 10 acres, I don't know, but I would definitely call, I would definitely find, find out. Okay. Um, we've got one other one here. It's, um, will, CP43 help me in Phelps. I'm going to guess, is that Phelps County? Yeah, the CP43 program can be used on um, corn and soybean fields anywhere in the state. It doesn't have to be in a historically prairie area. Because again, you know, we've got areas of our state where we've cleared forest and we've created, you know, cropland. <laughs> so, you know, it, yeah, it, you can be anywhere. And if now I will say, you know, there aren't many prairie strips installed yet in Missouri, and, and sometimes even NRCS staff are not as familiar. But it is their federal program. I mean, they're they're supposed to. They have to tell you about it. If you have any questions or you're having trouble, you'd be welcome to contact me, um, and I'll try to help you connect with the you know NRCS person. But you should. I mean, you just say, hey, I'm interested in CP43 prairie strips practice. I'm a, um, you know, I'm a soybean farmer or, you know, I have corn and I want to install this and they, you know, they've got the information. It's their program. All right. Well, I'm going to uh, finish up with one last question. If for those of us out there who don't have, you know, substantial land, we just have a home with a lawn and we've got some uh, edging areas or around a tree or, you know, along a walkway. If there was only one plant that you would recommend that uh, would be used in our landscaping, what would that be? That's a really good question. And also, yeah, you know what? You don't have to do a ton. Anything that you can do is going to be helpful. So start small. And I mean, there's 2000, you know, we've got tons of native plants and it's hard for me to pick just one. But I will say um, purple coneflower is you know it does well in partial shade and full sun it germinates really easily you know can tolerate a lot of different soil types um i would probably pick that one as like a beginner plant and i will also mention that the missouri prairie foundation has a number of native plant sales where numerous um, native plant vendors come together and sell we have um one coming, I think it's April 17th. I can't, it's, um, but on at the Nita B. Gorman Conservation Nature Center in Kansas City, which would be the closest one for Cass County. And we'll have another one in September. And, but we, we have numerous of them planned for all over the state. We'll have those on our website here pretty soon. So that's a great place to buy, buy native plants. Well, that's excellent. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in. Just like I said, a lot of this was excellent. So glad that they attended. So thank you so much, Carol. And I appreciate you taking the time to do this. And um, uh, I, I definitely learned a lot as well.
Thank you. And also I'll add, you all should probably get a follow-up email with a survey, a link to a survey from the Missouri Humanities Council. Mm -hmm. And they would really love it if you could provide some feedback. I think it's very short, but they'd like to know, did you enjoy this presentation? Was it useful? What other kinds of programming would you like? So if you could um, respond to that survey, that would be wonderful. And if, and I hope that you, that you get it. If somebody could somehow I did see it come up whenever you saw it come I up. Okay, perfect. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you all so much. Thanks for the opportunity, Jennifer, and everybody have a, a wonderful evening. Thank you. Bye-bye.